Moving on. Yeah, uh, it's live now. We can get started. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a warm welcome to all. Uh, uh, to the uh, welcome, we, uh, we welcome you to the sixth uh, uh, edition of the Cosmic Tales series and outreach program uh, conducted by uh, uh, thirteen different uh, astronomy clubs from uh, different institutes. Uh, so today we have an eminent uh, speaker uh, 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 speaking on the topic of uh, uh, gravitational lensing. So uh, the effect of gravitational fields on light has played a role in fundamental physics from the time of Newton. Uh, it entered the realm of astronomy after Einstein's prediction was verified by the famous eclipse experiment of 1919. Apart from some insightful suggestions, the subject lay dormant until the double quasar discovery with the exact same spectral lines in 1979. This led to an explosion of observations, theory, and application which which continues uh, till today. Uh, it also revived some interest in some certain aspects of uh, geometrical optics, which will be covered in the final part of the talk. So, uh, Professor Rajaram Nithyananda is an Indian physicist uh, whose fields of research are on astronomical optics, image processing and reconstruction, and uh, gravitational dynamics of uh, galaxies. He completed his BSc and MSc degrees in Madras University and IIT Madras, respectively, and received his PhD in Bangalore University. Uh, he was also the former director of uh, the National Center for Radio Astronomy, Pune, and uh, TAFR uh, Hyderabad, and is currently a professor at uh, Azim Premji University, Bangalore. Uh, he also serves as the chief editor of the Resonance Journal and associate editor of the Journal of Astrophysics and Astronomy. Uh, both the journals are part of the Indian Academy of uh, of uh, Sciences. Um, uh, so yeah, we can uh, at the end of the talk we'll have a Q and A uh, session. Uh, uh, you can, in the meanwhile, you can type your uh, questions in the chat box, or if you're watching it through the live stream, you can type it there as well. We take up both the questions. So, without any further ado, I would like to pass the mic on to uh, Professor. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, Arjun. Uh, that's interesting. I just tested it and this time it's not happening. Let me let me uh, try something else. Okay, now uh, I'm really sorry, but we tested this just a very short while ago and it worked and uh, it is working now. So, so you'll have to excuse me while I... Okay, I, I think this Libre office is just hanging. Huh? I think that's what's... Okay. Okay, it's a problem at my end. I'll, I'll have to shut down the computer. Huh? So I'm sorry, it'll, it'll delay things by about a few minutes because uh, nothing wrong with Zoom or anything else, but uh, I, I think I will have to shut down the computer and we'll start. Uh, well? Uh, yes, no problem. no problem. Oh, it's come. Okay, yeah. that's strange. All right. So uh, you already heard that I intend to talk about uh, Start with fundamental physics and start with Newton. So, ah, but it isn't changing, right? I'm trying to change it now and it isn't changing. Uh, ah, okay, 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 no, it did, it did change. Yeah, oh, okay. okay, right. So, uh, Newton wrote this book called Optics, spelled in this interesting way. Sir, I think you still have to present your slides, sir. Ah, so, okay. Yeah, you're not sharing. Okay, okay, I'm not presenting, right? Okay, let's see uh, how things work. Okay, some strange things are happening here. Right. So here is.
Okay, so let's see slideshow, current slide. Yeah. So yes, sir, it's visible now. I think we're in business now. Right. Yes, it's visible. So, uh, this book was written in English, unlike his Principia was written in Latin, and it was in a very different style. Uh, so, right at the end, this was quite late in his life, he, he had lots of unsolved problems. So, he just put them down in the form of uh, what he called queries. Today, we would call them speculations, uh, not the interesting spellings and so on. But clearly, he's saying that, and when he says, do not, like a question, he really means, uh, yeah, it does act, but I don't have the time to. Uh, and this Latin probably means all other things being. So that's where Newton left it with just a statement. But uh, it took quite a bit, bit of time before someone had the courage to do a calculation based on Newtonian physics. Now, of course, Newtonian physics is not really capable of handling something going at the speed of light. Okay? But what this gentleman did was to imagine uh, just a, a particle of some mass being shot at a high speed past another heavy mass. So this doesn't move. This moves almost in a straight line. But because of this short time where it spends near this mass, it gets a sideward kick and its direction changes. Right. So that's what you would call the deflection of light. So this is a function of uh, something which is called impact parameter, which is uh, B is the standard symbol. And uh, that's just the amount by which this trajectory would miss the center of this object. And a very simple estimate for the angle of deflection would be to calculate uh, the amount of perpendicular velocity which is picked up in this encounter and divide it by the parallel velocity. So at the same level of making a very rough estimate, uh, a lot of the time there is no force. But when it's close to this mass, say, where the distance is of the order of b, you will get uh, an acceleration gm over b squared. So little m cancels, right, the mass of this. And then the time for the, which this acceleration acts is roughly b over b. If this is b, it's roughly this distance, which is of the, also of the order of b, right? So this whole thing is the numerator, delta v perpendicular, denominator is v. So finally, you end up with this combination gm over bv squared. So the answer to Newton's question is the deflection will be inversely proportional to uh, this impact parameter. So as you go further and further away, it will become very small and inversely proportional to the square of the speed. Now, of course, uh, Solner simply put v equal to c. Okay. If you want to do a better calculation, you have to integrate, right? There is a little bit of force here and here also, even though it gets much weaker. So you apply Pythagoras theorem and you know you figure out this distance, which is mb squared plus x squared, then you divide by that. I mean, I'm just showing you this formula. You don't have to do it online. And you get a formula pretty much like what we wrote down, except you get this correct numerical factor, 2gm over bv squared is Soldner's formula. But of course, no one believed it because you know no one knew anything about how light and gravity would interact. But if you just plug in the numbers for the sun, right? Uh, here's the mass of the sun. And the closest you can get without actually hitting the sun is 700,000 kilometers. And you'll get an angle of uh, 0.9 arc seconds. And I think to a club called Parsec, I don't have to say what an arc, arc second is, right? It's a really small angle. Or in, in radians, there it is. So there it matter rested. Einstein started thinking about this question. He arrived at the same result, but in a in a much in a more Einsteinian way, right? Uh, he was not he was interested in fundamental physics, and he used this. He was guided by this principle that a little g can be imitated by a situation where there's no gravity, but you are in some kind of elevator, which is accelerating upwards by g. So, for example, if you have an object which in a normal inertial frame is just at rest, in this Elevator, it'll appear to be accelerating downwards by g. And in fact, Einstein checked that you know all experiments will behave in the same way as they would with g. So now we can ask, what would a beam of light look like to this observer? So to an observer outside, uh, let's say the ray is horizontal, just keeps 
going horizontally, no change in direction. Now you could have, before going to an accelerated observer, you could have a uniformly moving observer. In, uh, of course, if the observer moves parallel to the light ray, you'll only see a Doppler shift. You won't see a change in direction. But if the observer moves perpendicular to the light ray, you will see a change in direction. Very well known to astronomers, uh, he, he, even in, in 1690s, it's the phenomenon of aberration. Right? As the Earth goes around the sun, the direction of stars actually changes by about 20 arc seconds. It's a famous experiment by Bradley. So a uniformly uh, moving observer will again see light moving in a straight line. But an accelerated observer will uh, keep seeing the direction changing. right? So the ray will curve. And this is the clever argument by which Einstein calculated the reflection of light. Uh, then, of course, substituted this acceleration by g. And then you get the same formula. Okay? 0.9 arc seconds at the edge of the sun. And this was put to the test. It's one of the dramatic episodes in the history of science uh, for many reasons. So this is May 1919. But these astronomers, English astronomers, actually went to the location, two locations, even six months earlier. And they selected two stars and uh, made a very accurate measurement of the angle between them. Okay, And it's all, of course, perfectly pre-planned. And uh, these stars were visible at midnight, which means six months later, uh, you would have to look at these stars around noon. right? So now you have the sun. And because of deflection, the same two rays that I showed you earlier will not reach the Earth. They will miss the Earth. So if you want to hit the Earth, you will have to displace the ray a little bit so that after it is bent, it will meet the Earth. Same for the ray from the other star. So this has this slightly paradoxical effect that the angle between these two stars will increase because of the deflection of light. Okay. So uh, this was measured, right? And of course, oh, I omitted <laughs> important detail which was mentioned by Arjun in the introduction. You need to block sunlight, otherwise you can't see stars in the daytime. So this had to be done at the time of a total solar eclipse. You literally had minutes to do it. In fact, there were clouds, all kinds of uh, drama took place. Uh, the measured deflection was 1.8 arc seconds. So if this experiment had been done in 1909, it would have been a disaster for Einstein because uh, you know he would have got the wrong result. But by 1919, he had improved his theory. It was no longer, he, he could even throw away this principle of equivalence because he had equations giving you a curved space time. So one thing which is neglected in the earlier calculations, we use Euclidean geometry. So when Einstein put in the proper geometry, uh, he got exactly double his old result and he got it in time so that the experiment verified the result. So this is the formula, right? Our old formula, but now with a four sitting there. Uh, it's also sometimes written, after all, this has to be dimensionless, right? So because of B in the denominator, everything else is a length. And uh, this length is called the Schwarzschild radius. If you calculate it for the sun, only contains the mass and the speed of light. It comes out to be uh, three kilometers. Uh, and one interesting way of looking at it is, which is what Schwarzschild did essentially, is that if you compress the mass of the sun to three kilometers from 700,000 kilometers, which is of course a tall order, then uh, uh, the escape velocity will reach the velocity of light. So that's the black hole, but we are not getting into black holes today. Okay? But this is called the short sheet. So this is the deflection by a point mass. Then Einstein, I mean, just for fun, wrote another paper saying that the Earth happens to be very close to the sun, but suppose I went further back. Then maybe I could see this effect even with a single star. So this, uh, this is, uh, see the stars are shown here, but they're actually very far away. So I just, the star is really a pair of parallel rays. And uh, then you could actually uh, see uh, the star on both sides of uh, the sun or any other mass. Okay, so you can do this calculation for the sun, right? Uh, and you find uh, you could think of this almost like the focal length of a lens, except it's not really a very good lens because it depends on this b. If you increase b, then of course the deflection becomes less. Whereas in a good lens, it should have a larger reflection to reach the same focus. Still, the term gravitational lensing has sort of stuck, even though these are not good lenses. So anyway, just for fun, he, in fact, he himself said that this is, you know, this is just, this is never going to be seen. But if you went to find astronomical units, 
you could see. And it's not just two images. If you're really symmetric, everything in line, this figure could have been drawn in any plane and you would see an entire ring. So that term is stuck. It's called the Einstein ring. Okay. But of course, it requires this very special geometry. So then uh, another famous astronomer, uh, Henry Norris Russell of HR diagram, uh, decided that he would, uh, you know, not take such a symmetric situation, right? So this is the same figure as earlier, but now things are not perfectly aligned. So now there will be a preferred plane. If you had three points in a line, any plane can go through it. But now there is this preferred plane and all the action takes place in this plane, you get two images. Uh, actually, if this was transparent, you could even get a third, but you know, you don't get that. So uh, then one can ask what happens to these two images, right? Uh, so here is what you would see if there was no deflector. So the jargon is this is called source, this is called deflector, this is called observer. So uh, this is what the observer sees. So now we are looking from this direction. Yeah. It's kind of ghostly because the observer won't see that. The moment you put in the deflector, as I explained to you, <laughs> one image gets kind of repelled. Except I've drawn a slightly <coughs> better figure. This is not a point. So every point in this has to be pushed outwards. And therefore, you can see this dimension increases. Okay. So it's a magnified image. Uh, on the other hand, this dimension reduces, but it's still a magnified image. Because why does this uh, dimension reduce? Because this uh, inner part gets uh, deflected by some amount. The outer part gets deflected by a smaller amount because uh, theta is smaller, right? So it's things are elongated. And in the other image, what happens is it looks something like this. So this is what Russell worked out. And then, of course, he, he was also not taking it very seriously because he published it in Scientific America and called it some impossible tests of the general theory of relativity. Okay. But you know, impossibility in the 1920s is became reality in the 1990s. Okay. Um, I'm not going in historical order. I'll jump back to 1970s and so on. But since we are talking about this kind of geometry of uh, a mass and a star behind it. Uh, this again was not the first experiment, but it's a very successful experiment called the optical uh, gravitational lens experiment. Okay. Uh, this is a telescope and this is, this is a rather small telescope. It's 1.3 meters. So you don't hear of great astronomical discoveries being made with a 1.3 meter telescope. But uh, if you have a great idea, then that can happen. And the idea is due to a Polish astronomer who, of course, also spent half his career in the United States, Budan Pechinski. And then, of course, he uh, roped in all his friends in Poland uh, once he had this idea. Now, how do you overcome this ridiculously small probability of one object coming in front of another object? Right? And uh, let's say the probability is one in you know, 10 million or something. Well, you study 10 million objects. Now. That's what you do. Right? And the technology for that was available and keeps improving. So they have these fantastic CCDs, computers, data acquisition. So it's really a big experiment, a big collaboration. So here is the typical result from OGLP. Uh, every event has its name. So uh, this is the magnifications. And by the way, they are not seeing the individual images. It's in all micro arc seconds, which you can't see with 1.3 meter telescope or with an optical telescope. But they can see the brightness of the star go up and come back. So stars do uh, brighten for other reasons. But the shape of this curve is completely predicted by... Uh, in fact, you could calculate it yourself using the Einstein's formula. Right? What's the magnification? And the reason why... See, the stars are not at rest. right? So the geometry is changing. So when you're best aligned, but you're still not in the Einstein ring situation, you have the maximum magnification, which turned out to be about three, and then it came. Uh, they had, you know, hundreds of such events. But this is a special event. Because, so this whole thing lasts for almost a month. Right? Uh, uh, incidentally, these are stars in, uh, in our own galaxy. And we don't know what came in front of it. In fact, one of the motivations uh, of this is to look for dark objects. You know, objects which have mass but not light. But you can see it fits this curve beautifully. Except for this little bit, which lasts only one day. 
right? And uh, the conclusion was that this star also has a planet around it, right? Which also, and of course, the planet's moving quite rapidly. So that also came in front briefly and created little extra magnification. And uh, of course, people would not believe this if this was the only example. But here's another example, quite a beautiful example from the same experiment. But you can see it's not only really one experiment. Once they start seeing something like this, they contact all their friends who are also running such experiments. And then you can see the data points. And I also told you that it fits this model. And the model you know, is simply based on optics and uh, that Einstein's formula, nothing else. And look at the fit to the model. It's fantastic. Right? This is called residuals. After subtracting the model, is so this bit is the planet which lasts, you know, uh, just a couple of days. And this big thing is the star. Mm -hmm. So these experiments have uh, thrown a lot of light on uh, the mass, including mass in very low mass stars. And uh, the hope was that they would see uh, the origin of dark matter, if dark matter was in some form. But that did not happen. The number of such events would have been much larger if dark matter had been made up of, say, planets. Uh, but this experiment was very successful. Now I'm uh, moving back to 1979. Uh, you could say the modern era of gravitational lensing started then, right? Uh, this was named the double quasar. Again, I should have checked all the previous talks, whether there was any talk about quasars, which are uh, extremely bright objects. Uh, and today we know it was a mystery for Decades, today we know that this is matter falling into a black hole and just before it disappears, emitting a huge amount of radiation in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so this uh, is, of course, I'm cheating a li little bit. This is not the picture that they took in 1979. This is with the Hubble Space Telescope much later. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, even with the Hubble Space Telescope, it has some supports for the mirror and those supports cause these diffraction spikes. If you have a point source, right? So that's what tells you that these are two uh, bright point sources. Whereas this diffuse thing doesn't have these spikes. That's a galaxy. And then you can measure the spectrum, which will tell you how far away it is. And uh, the galaxy actually is in front. And these two objects are uh, at a much higher uh, edge. Right? Now, of course, quasars had been uh, discovered and studied. These two were, in fact, first found by radio astronomers. But uh, First of all, finding two quasars, you know, there were a couple of hundred quasars known at that time. What's the chance that you'll find two separated by seven hour seconds? All right. And then when the spectrum was taken, and you heard this from Arjun, they turned out to be virtually identical. Okay. I mean, the ratio. And then this was confirmed across the electromagnetic spectrum. So that was a bit too much of a coincidence. And, uh, and then people, of course, immediately went and found other cases. Right. So these are... Uh, so this is an example of a gravitational lens. Uh, there are differences with the case of point masses. Now, it's not that difficult to calculate the uh, gravitational deflection by a galaxy. You just think of it as a large number of point masses, and you can do some integral. But because a galaxy is not spherical in shape, uh, the formula for deflection will be a little more interesting. It could be different. At the same distance, it could be different in different directions from the galaxy. And uh, Looking at these uh, seven arc seconds tells you already how much mass there is. It's very clear that you're not seeing all the mass in this galaxy. That's the story of dark matter, which I'm sure will be part of your series of lectures. Perhaps more than one. Okay. So this was the double quasar. Right? Then, uh, and this is again interesting. Uh, we are now going to an even bigger scale. No, we started on the scale of our own galaxy, then went to a scale of you know, a fairly distant galaxy and a quasar behind it. Now, here, this is a cluster of galaxies. So each one of these is a galaxy. Right? And uh, again, people had studied these for a very long time. And you can tell that these galaxies are in the same region of space because they have similar redshifts. Right? And they are clustered. You see a much larger number in this region, and the density falls off. So again, unless it's a bizarre coincidence, these objects are gravitationally bound to each other, moving around. So already people had made rough estimates of the mass of these clusters. And it turned out to be greater than the mass of the individual galaxies. Okay, But here is independent evidence now. So people started seeing these arcs, not in all clusters. 
but in a few of them, uh, again, you take the spectrum of this R and you find that uh, although it's so bright, it's actually behind this cluster. It's at a greater distance. Okay. So this is the image of a galaxy and this is not the only image. This also has the same spectrum, this arc. And maybe there are a couple of other arcs also. Right? That which, so this is an amazing uh, phenomenon. Uh, one simple way to think about it is the alignment of that background galaxy is almost perfect. So you almost get a full Einstein ring, but it's not perfect. So you get you know, a large part of an Einstein ring. But actually, you have to do better calculations. Now, historically, these pictures were taken in the 1970s before gravitational lenses were discovered. So these astronomers at Lick Observatory, they didn't even publish it. Whenever it was, someone visited them, they showed me, hey, look at this picture of the cluster. What is this weird object? And they would all laugh. Uh, and then in the 1980s, I think, uh, a team of French astronomers independently found this. And then when they published, of course, all the old pictures also came out. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that this was, in some sense, predicted. Okay. I mean, in 1937. And this is one of the great names in extragalactic astronomy. He's called Zwicky. Right? And I, I just put his paper, Nebulae as Gravitational Lenses. He's probably the first person to use that term. Right? I have not reproduced his whole paper. Just wanted you to see the date of the paper and the title, which says that he clearly had the idea. He himself had concluded that clusters have a lot more mass than what we are seeing. So he's also the father of dark matter in some sense. Okay. He quotes Einstein, chance to observe this effect for stars is extremely small. And then he says, now there's one more interesting thing which uh, I'd like to point out. Normally, you know, when people collaborate, sometimes the uh, authors appear in alphabetical order. So Mr. Zwicky obviously would, you know, would be right at the end Except here is a friend of his who actually <laughs> would come after him in alphabetical order, which is very rare. Right? And by the way, this man is famous. See, he invented the first TV camera called the Iconoscope. So, should be. Now I'm uh, coming to another uh, application of gravitational lensing, which is called weak lensing. I already uh, told you that uh, you get a distorted image of any background object. Now, especially with a galaxy, if the ray passes a little far away from the galaxy, you may not get multiple images, and we will see that. But you would still get a distortion of the image. And this is a rather brilliant idea by these two authors. I'm not giving detailed references because today, one thing is I can make the presentation available, and all you have to do is Google, and you will get the references if you want to read. Right? So they had this nice idea that, okay, you have a cluster of galaxies, but you're not lucky to see some uh, perfectly aligned background object, which is giving you these arcs, you can still say a lot about the mass in this cluster. Just look at all the galaxies behind it. Uh, no multiple images. But what you would find is that they would be elongated tangentially. Right? That's what we saw in the case of the point mass. Same is true for the cluster. But see, galaxies are not circles, right? It may be elongated just because that particular galaxy happened to you know, be an LF, uh, spiral galaxy. So how do you know? So they said, we'll take a statistical approach. After all, there are so many background galaxies. Again, you need fantastic technology for this. CCDs, which you know, capture hundreds of thousands of galaxies. So uh, this is one cluster of galaxies. And it so happens, this is a, a rare case where there were two clusters of galaxies quite close to each other. Okay. And by studying these background galaxies, people followed sorry this uh, method of uh, Kaiser and Squires called weak lensing. And they were able to match. So these contours, which you see, is the unseen mass, which is causing a distortion of the images of galaxies. No single galaxy will show this, in fact. But you know, in, in a small square like this, if you had 100 galaxies, then you could say, on the average, they are elongated. Right? And that's uh, how sir, this... I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, somebody has raised their hand. Uh, yeah, uh, sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Akanj, you wanted to ask something, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, I would like to ask, like, how do we calculate the gravitational lensing of a star? Like, what is the formula? How do I get a, the gravitational lensing of a star? Oh, I showed the formula, no? Theta is equal to 4 gm over c squared b. Yeah. So, all you need to know is the mass and the distance at which the ray passes from the star. That, that, okay. was, that was up earlier. Uh, unless I've misunderstood your question. Uh, that's... 
and the same formula works for uh, uh, distributed mass by integration. You calculate the deflection caused by each one of them and superpose. That's an approximation, but a pretty good way. Sir, actually, I'm a ninth standard, so I don't know much about it. Oh, okay. But I, I okay. Then I'll simply say the uh, the deflection angle of deflection is uh, proportional to the mass of the star and inversely proportional to the distance uh, at which the ray passes the star. Okay. Okay, sir. And yes, there's sir. a clean formula for that. Yeah. Were you there at the beginning of the lecture? You were. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was there. Okay. Okay. So that's the same what I should. Huh? So. So this is uh, sort of consistent with what was believed about clusters, that uh, these galaxies are moving around in a potential caused by a lot of dark matter. Same is true of this cluster. But what is the real surprise is there is another uh, component of mass in a cluster of galaxies, which is very difficult to see. This is the gas left over after these galaxies were formed. But because of the gravitational uh, force of the cluster, it becomes extremely hot. Uh, paradoxically, it's so hot that you don't see it because the, it's completely ionized. So you don't see any spectra or anything, but it emits a lot in X-rays. Okay. So when the X-rays were uh, mapped, so that's these contours, the X-rays are coming from the region in between the two clusters. Right. Um, and this was explained, that's the reason for the name bullet, <coughs> that actually these two clusters of galaxies have passed through each other. Excuse me. <coughs> right. Now, of course, the dark matter and the stars don't collide with each other. But gas, you cannot push two streams of gas through each other. So they collide and they get heater, heated up. So uh, this is a beautiful application, both of X-ray astronomy and of weak lensing. Hmm? Now, uh, <laughs> in the next slide, I have something called weaker lensing. Uh, so this has to do with uh, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, I'm sure you have all heard of the cosmic microwave background. One of the great triumphs of, uh, well, I can be a little parochial and say radio astronomy. Right? In 1965, this uh, radiation from all directions was discovered. Uh, it had an average temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin. Uh, yeah. But what is uh, even more interesting, it has small fluctuations in temperature, which are one lakh times smaller, 30 micro Kelvin. And these uh, fluctuations are terribly important because they show that even at that early time, before you had formed any galaxies, you just had hot plasma, you had small excesses and deficiencies of density, which would later on form galaxies, clusters. Etc. So that is the uh, CMB story. But what the Planck people could do because they're, it is all from a satellite, by the way. It was uh, so excellent. Then <laughs> they could do the same trick with these little blobs. Statistically, these blobs would all be uh, not have any preferred orientation. But if you found they're elongated in some regions, that means on their way to us, there was some map in between. And they made a map of the dark matter in the universe. This is a very weak effect. But you're able to see it because of uh, superb data and lots of statistics, right? So uh, this is a map and then a cosmologist can say, okay, is this reasonable? By the way, this is the part where they could not make the map because it happens to be our own galaxy. And of course, the radio, yeah, the radio waves from our own galaxy, you know, interfere with this cosmic world. So I've kind of walked you through a lot of the astronomical applications of uh, gravitational lenses, okay? And uh, I kept the optics for the end <laughs> for, uh, for the reason that's actually a kind of favorite subject of mine. So I, if I'd started with it, uh, I might have taken up too much time. So the motivation is that uh, people started finding images like this. This is called Einstein cross, for example. Here's another one, one of the early ones. These, uh, these are very close to each other, so it could only be seen with the Hubble Space Telescope, HST. Right? How do you model a situation like this? Now, qualitatively, you can say, okay, there was an Einstein line. Uh, if this had been a point mass or a completely spherical mass, you would have got an Einstein line. But I already told you that uh, an elliptical galaxy does not have uh, the same properties of deflecting light. So maybe 
you know, if the deflection of light is more complicated, maybe you could get image geometries like this. But how do you analyze that, right? So that's where the optics comes in. You need a more sophisticated approach to geometrical optics. So uh, to get the sophisticated approach, you uh, have from the 20th century, uh, you don't come forward, you go back. <laughs> you go back to Fermat in 1662, Huygens in 1690, and uh, Hamilton, the Irish mathematician. And they all told us uh, that the best way to think of geometrical optics is actually in terms of wave fronts. Okay. So let me uh, explain that. So here is now uh, the source. So we're going to going back to the situation of a source, a deflector, which could be a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, and an observer. And we're going to work out, you know, what's the way to figure out all the images? You're going to get you know, a large number of images. So you construct a wave front. So in fact, uh, uh, a Norwegian astronomer called Refsdal put it beautifully. He said, suppose there's a supernova explosion in this galaxy. Then the light from that supernova explosion will occupy a wave front like this, right? It's a sphere, which is uh, increasing in size. And then let us say it encounters a mass on the way, right? Now, we are used to thinking that this mass deflects the light. But what does deflection mean in terms of a wave front? So I, I gave you this formula. Forget the factor in front. Deflection is proportional to 1 over B. But deflection is also the slope of this wave front, right? If you draw a normal to this wave front, that's the ray. So this uh, rays, which pass very far away from this mass, uh, are not deflected. Rays which pass above it are deflected down. Rays which pass below are deflected up. And since this is uh, more or less transparent, if it's a uh, cluster of galaxies or galaxy, a ray right through the center would again go through straight, right? So this uh, shape of the wavefront encodes the deflection of the rays. And you can even, if you take the point mass formula, you can even find the shape. So this is called gravitational time delay, right? Effectively, this part of the wavefront is delayed and that explains the deflection. And this has been measured even in the solar system. But for us, we can see if the formula is log of b, then the slope will be 1 over b, right? So now there's an observer, traditionally drawn as an eye, which of these rays are going to reach the observer? Now you could draw all the normals here and hit or miss. Some of them will hit and some of them will miss. But there's actually a cleverer way to do this, which is from this observer, send out another spherical wave. Okay. Now, this one has been sent from the observer. So the normal to this wavefront, all of them point to the observer, right? So now you have to compare the normal to this wavefront and the normal to this wavefront. And wherever they are parallel, Excuse me, sir. Sir, you're muted. Anyway, never mind. Yeah. Uh, did we get to the stage where uh, this wavefront is just being constructed as if it went out from the observer? All normals to it point to the observer, all the rays. Whereas this one has come from the source, has passed the lens, right? And we are looking for the places where the two normals agree, which is also the place where one is tangential to the other. So I've already shown you the first point where these two are tangential, so you'll get one image here. Okay. Then the next point. Uh, ah, okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is tangent somewhere here. And there's a third one actually. <laughs> right. So you get three images which you could have also guessed from drawing the rays, but this construction tells you exactly where they are. Also tells you something interesting, that if this was a supernova, and this is what Refsdal said, oh, I'm so sorry, I seem to be keep going back. The three images will light up at different times, right? This one will light up first. <laughs> this is delayed and this is still not delayed. And uh, he said this in 1964, when even gravitational lenses had never been discovered. And 
I think even after he passed away, finally a supernova was discovered in Lens Galaxy, and one by one the images did light up. So that's a great prediction made by a great astronomer. So now this is uh, the nicer way of. Uh, you also notice. Uh, so let's just uh, take any one of the images, right? Say this one. Yeah. If I look at the time delay, this reaches you first. If just the ray had wanted to go here and come here, it could have taken a longer time. Likewise here. So the Fermat principle that light takes the path of least time actually is working. So this that's why I had Fermat on the previous thing. <coughs> you think in terms of wavefronts, uh, and of course the maths behind all this was given by Hamilton. So, right? So this proved to be a very useful uh, tool, right? So I'm giving you an example. Uh, so here is, uh, if it had just been the geometrical time delay, it would have just been a parabola. So, I mean, if you suppose there had been no uh, deflector, if we just had two wavefronts touching each other at a single point, that will be the shortest path, and it will increase quadratically as you move away from that point. But now we are going to introduce this additional uh, time delay. So that's how you get uh, three points. In fact, this would be an Einstein ring. If it was so symmetric, it would be an Einstein ring. Right? So this is now arrival time versus positional wave time. Right? So Fermat's principle tells you that you should pick either the maxima or the minima uh, of this. Yeah. Perfect alignment, you get a ring. You move it away. So I'm now moving moving the lens away from the center of this parabola. If you move it far away, you will, uh, these two maximum and minimum will merge. And uh, right? you'll still get magnification and distortion. Right? And I've also given a reference to a review article from which I've taken this figure. Right? So now uh, my last slide will be telling you uh, how this works in two dimensions, right? Because I've, shown theta as if it is just a single angle, but actually uh, there are two th thetas in the sky. So uh, more interesting things can happen, right? So the basic idea is you have a geometric time delay, which is a very simple function of theta. It's just theta squared, right? And it need not be symmetric because the observer can move and the lens potential uh, can be distorted because the shape of the galaxy is not spherical. And it turns out that this is, so I've given some references here. And here is an example, right? So this one is just the geometric time delay. Huh? So now I'm representing a function of two variables, which has a minimum here. So think of this as a kind of bowl. Uh, unfortunately, while copying this figure from the journal, we got some strange extra lines. Huh? Uh, please ignore those. Huh? Just, just look at the thick lines. Hmm? So the L stands for low. Purely geometric time delay, you get a single image. Then someone starts introducing some additional delay. Hmm? So as if this is a valley, but someone is now pushing up a hill. Okay. So this gets distorted, deviated. But if the person pushes it up the hill high enough, you'll get a high, you'll get a low, right? And then uh, so if you, if some of you are familiar with the maps, geographical maps, right? It's as if this is the hill and this is the valley. And then between the two, you'll always have a ridge, right? Uh, this is called a saddle, saddle point. Um, I, I can explain saddle point uh, if uh, someone wants. Basically, if you have a function of two variables, uh, it can be a minimum in one direction, but a maximum in another direction, right? So if I go from this valley to this valley, uh, it'll be a maximum. But if I go from this hill, I go down to the side and then I go up again. Hmm? But if you keep pushing this up, uh, right? What happens is <laughs> one more saddle and low appear here. So you can understand five image configurations. You can understand how they move around. So that's what I meant uh, in the abstract when I said that uh, you can use more powerful methods of uh, geometrical optics and powerful mathematics. So, of course, a mathematician called Morse 
early in the 20th century uh, gave the general theory if you have a function you know how many maxima middle minima saddle points can it have and uh, there are some constraints you notice that we couldn't create just on one saddle we had to create the saddle and load together we had to create this high and this saddle together right and then it's very interesting to see what happens when two of these images merge the intensity becomes very large so this is called uh, uh, the singularity theory another branch so again more uh, references right uh, so that completes my account of uh, these three aspects and i think i hope i didn't go too fast because i seem to have done it almost perfectly in 45 minutes but i hope if uh, i hope that leaves uh, time for quite a bit of discussion okay so i'll stop sharing at this point uh, okay so we can move on to the q and a q and a uh, session now uh, so yeah the first question is by uh, rajat so how can we conclude from the uh, cmb radiation observations that the deflections were caused by dark matter only like on their way towards the earth uh, they could have been deflected uh, uh, like lensed by later formed galaxies also in stuff dark matter right you are right it measures the total mass in the universe it just so happens that the dark matter is uh, uh, six or seven times the visible matter and that has already been established by studies of individual galaxies and clusters of galaxies so i agree with you i i should not have said it's purely dark it's a map of all the matter in the universe it's also a very peculiar map because <laughs> this radiation is coming towards you it gets deflected by something but by the time it has reached you that something may have gone somewhere else so it's not a snapshot so this is one of the interesting things about cosmology that uh, uh, you normally think of studying the universe as geography you see different objects lying at different distances but when the distances become billions of light years you are also seeing them at earlier times so you are not slicing the universe uh, along a line of constant time you are slicing it along what is called a light cone okay so yes you are seeing a distribution of matter could be dark could be anything uh, okay so the next question is uh... is there any way we can create mass even if its theory is negative mass real well uh, depends on which theory you believe in uh, the uh, einstein's general theory of relativity uh, doesn't allow you to create mass hmm? and uh, uh, if uh, if the person who asked the question who, who asked the question sir it's me ah. sir i can't ah so uh, depending on what you studied i could give a kind of analogy uh you uh, for example you can ask can i create charge right in and then you have this gauss theorem which tells you that i can draw a surface i can measure the electric field and uh, so then that also tells you you can't create charge i mean charge can cross the surface but you cannot create it. so there's a similar theorem in einstein's theory. however there are other theories in which you can create mass and there was a hoyle nerlikar theory uh, where they had something called a c field which yeah in a sense even that obeyed the theorem but they created positive mass and then negative energy in the c field so but that theory uh, anyway is not one of the accepted cosmological theories today at the same time of course people are looking for improvements on einstein theory for two reasons there's something called dark energy which could be something we don't know about something new and in the big bang itself einstein theory breaks down so you may want a better theory um akansh uh, you have raised your hand yeah you can go ahead yes sir so i need to ask you a question like mm -hmm. i was just thinking of a theory like if it is possible to bring a um, build a warp drive so we need a positive mass at the front end negative mass at the back end so if somehow we could create mass it would help the you know sir the human civilization so is can you just name a theory like which says that we can build mass or negative mass is possible sir because i don't have much idea about it okay it's interesting that you mentioned this combination of positive and negative mass uh, in einstein theory also see it's a mathematical theory so once you give a set of equations mathematicians will find all kinds of solutions okay so one of them actually represents a positive and negative mass uh, and they kind of accelerate maybe that's why you called it a warp drive 
but uh, this particular mathematical solution assumes that these masses were there forever. So most of the work in general theory of relativity uh, relies on something called uh, the energy condition, which basically tells you that you cannot have a negative mass. But of course, there are very courageous people who are exploring the consequences, warp drives, wormholes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, since I am not an expert in general relativity, but uh, coming from the astronomy side, I guess one tends to be a little conservative. And uh, just look at the theories which are based on the phenomena which we are seeing. Okay, so thank you, sir. Um, so the next question is, what may be the future in uh, gravitational lensing physics or will it only be more uh, discoveries? Okay. Mm. What usually happens in any branch of astronomy is that there's an initial exciting phase when you may discover new things. Uh, what we'll definitely see is a lot of applications. So gravitational lensing will become a tool, like spectroscopy, right? So today people take the spectra of stars. Taking the spectrum is not a big deal, but interpreting it, learning what's happening inside the star is a continuing process. So since gravitational lensing is really the only tool which allows you to study dark matter, which you cannot see. So that part, I'm, I'm pretty certain, and that is only going to improve because bigger telescopes are being made. There's something called uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is which has got probably the biggest camera ever. I mean, it'll still take another five years to be built, right? And uh, people have already, I mean, why were they given funds to build this telescope? The reason is that they said, look, when we can observe this much larger number of galaxies at greater and greater distances, then, of course, they had many you study cosmology directly by looking at these galaxies. And looking at lensing, you will learn a lot about dark matter. So I think that will be a continuing process. And on smaller scales also, uh, well, let me give you another interesting example of gravitational lensing. I didn't talk about it at all. But uh, many of you may know the news that a ring of uh, emission was found, radio emission, around a black hole in the galaxy M87, announced in uh, 2019. And more recently, the same radio observations have shown a magnetic field. Now, this is matter very close to the black hole. So it's not even lensing of the kind that we have discussed, where the deflection is very small. Okay. Around a black hole, a light can even orbit around it. Right? So uh, people are now looking for something called the photon ring. You <laughs> be, a, be a, a very thin ring around this uh, black hole, uh, regardless of what the source is, because it's not a property of the source, it's a property of the black hole. So that is the one exciting thing which people are looking for. So I don't think the field is dead yet by any means. But I, I do believe that a lot of the future things will come from improved observations. And invariably it's happened that when you, you know, observe in a range you have not observed before, you will... Uh, so for example, another thing, I think since you mentioned ICTS, I presume that uh, um, very likely Ajit talked to you about gravitational waves, right? Uh, was my guess correct? Yes, sir. The previous talk was about uh, 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 gravitational waves. Yes. Uh, and in fact, they have written a paper uh, on the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves. Okay. So the same gravitational wave source, you may be able to see it twice if it comes to you with some delay. And then what astrophysics can you do with that? Right. So yes, there, there are interesting things to be done. But of course, I'm not saying that everyone should do gravitational lensing. There are interesting things in radio astronomy, interesting things in planets. So in general, astronomy is flourishing, I would say. But flourishing, I want to emphasize uh, because of the fantastic improvement in observational capabilities, including space. Um, are there any other questions? If you have, uh, you can just unmute and speak if you want or put it up in the chat box. Okay, I, I read the chat question properly. So lensing physics, uh, the black hole would be an example of that. You'll be verifying the properties of photon orbits around the black hole. So, uh, Sir, I had a question. So mm -hmm. uh, when, you, uh, when you talk about lensing of different uh, wavelengths of light, like let's say uh, radio waves or uh, 
gamma rays or something like that is there a huge uh, difference in the uh, in the like intric intricate details about the formula and uh, the way it affects uh, uh, the propagation or something like that actually it's interesting the einstein elevator argument answers that question <laughs> because uh, the formula for elevation for aberration and doppler shift you know are independent of wavelength right yes and so one of the uh, basic signatures of gravitational lensing is wavelength independence however uh, you could get wavelength dependence coming from you could get wavelength dependence if you have diffraction now uh, of course the scale in gravitational lensing is too large so you don't see these fringes and all that right <coughs> but in principle if you if you had diffraction different wavelengths would diffract differently and that is actually true in, in the case of gravitational waves uh, so you know that one example the other reason why you might see difference at different wavelengths is that uh, as they pass through this uh, galaxy there could be absorption other things happening which is different for different wavelengths and the other reason interesting reason is time delay so you know the two images may not be exactly identical a star may pass in front of one of the images and cause this micro lensing effect that i told you so in fact micro lensing was first discovered not in our own galaxy but in that uh, double quasar in the double quasar people noticed that one image became brighter and and that took almost a year and then they said okay uh, so the ratio of these two images changed okay so i i think that's uh, so there is fundamentally no wavelength dependence it's it's just uh, uh, photons moving in space time so it's um hi sir so uh, there are a lot of these alternate theories of gravity um and there are a lot of scientists working on them do you want to talk about how gravitational lensing either falsify or uh, especially the bullet cluster is something that is often uh thought of as a great example to disprove these alternate theories uh do you have any comments on this oh uh, yes so one of the alternate theories is given by a, a very respected israeli astrophysicist called milgram it's called mond modified newtonian dynamics okay so the motivation one of the motivations for dark matter was that if you went to the outer regions of any galaxy including our own and looked at uh the rotation of objects there stars gas anything you can just from v squared by r you can calculate the gravitational force right but then to create that gravitational force you need a certain amount of mass and then you can ask can i account for that mass in terms of stars and this is what another great astronomer vera rubin uh, pointed out in the 1980s i mean most people feel she should have got a nobel prize unfortunately she passed away before that could happen so that was the evidence for dark matter the so called flat rotation curve see in our solar system where there's no not that much dark matter the velocity of the planet keeps going down you know so you know earth goes at 30 maybe mars is 20 jupiter is 12 kilometers per second but in a galaxy the rotation velocity remains flat now milgram said maybe there's some other reason we'll modify the left hand side mv squared by r right uh people thought that such a silly theory but he kept <laughs> explaining so many things with the theory right but when you go to different scales like the cluster and so on it looks like uh, that theory is not able to do this so that's one alternate theory there are alternate theories in general relativity itself but they differ from general relativity mainly around black holes and so on so there people are hoping that this imaging of a black hole will put some constraints on these alternate theories so yes there is a whole industry of people who are Uh, using this black hole to test so um, yeah so in that sense physicists are very suspicious people or the community as a whole how uh, einstein's theory you know you say why go on testing it right but people would like to keep testing it till it fails i mean that's what happened to newton's theory right um akash you have raised your hand you can go ahead Yes, sir. Sir, my question is, sir, we know that light is massless. So, how does it get deflected by the gravity of stars and galaxies? See, if you think in Newtonian terms, uh, uh, that would be. So, I could give you a kind of cheating answer. I could say that light does not have rest mass, right? But of course, light never comes to rest. Okay? So, if you take if you take something which is not light, 
say one gram, and then you keep moving it toward the speed of light, the mass keeps increasing, right? Now, light has energy, however, and you could uh, divide that by c squared and call it a kind of mass, but that's not that's not a rest mass. That's its actual. So, I think a better way of stating it after Einstein's discovery of E equal to m c squared is that gravity acts on energy. That's one way of stating it. The other way of stating it is the principle of equivalence. That uh, uh, I don't care, you know, whether light has mass or not, but uh, if it moves in a certain way in an accelerated elevator, it has to move in the same way in gravity. So, so in one sense, we can say that gravity sometimes affects energy also. I think that's the best way of putting it. Okay, in fact, uh, let me tell you that it's equally yes. true that uh, if you had a box containing only photons, uh, that would attract uh, other bodies. So yes, but once mass and energy were unified by Einstein, you should think of gravity as acting on energy. Yeah. Okay, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, I have one question. Uh, the question is, uh, we know that I seem to have got cut off. I didn't hear the question. So can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is, we know that uh, gravitational lensing happens only when there is matter is present, right? Yeah. So uh, now, in when we talk about dark matter, we can uh, have an evidence of dark matter that even when there is no observance of physical mass, gravitational lensing is happening on its own. So there has to be some matter present there, and that yeah. justifies dark matter. But quant yes. theorists are telling that. Dark matter is some modification of gravity, and our understanding of gravity is less. So, how can we and how can gravitational lensing uh, prove dark matter and disprove Mond, or is the other way around? I think, as far as I know, Mond has not given a theory of gravitational lensing, as far as I know, and not on all scales. So, you may be able to explain lensing on some smaller scale, but then you have to explain it on the scale of clusters, on even a bigger scale, and so on. So, I would say that. Uh, my understanding of Mond is that uh, it, it had some limited success in explaining these rotation curves. The other thing is that it, it also has to uh, see the beauty of Einstein's theory is you can apply it to the solar system, you can apply it to a cluster of galaxies, you can apply it to the whole universe. It's a very general theory. I mean, it's also called the general theory of relativity. The Mond was, is more like a, a model which seems to work in some cases, and then you have to keep modifying the model depending on which situation you are at. So that's the reason why, uh, I mean, maybe a few people do work on Mon, but uh, it's uh, not as active as it used to be. Because there is... So then uh, gravitational lensing uh, indirectly proves dark matter, right? Then... Yes, yes, indirectly. As, as you heard from, uh, I think it was Sitara who mentioned the bullet cluster. That's a very spectacular example, where the dark matter has got separated from the visible matter. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, uh, seems like we can wind it up then. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, for uh, giving this wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it was a fun session. We had a good interactive session towards the ending as well. So, yeah, thank you so much once again. Okay, I can I can share uh, the presentation actually. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. That would be great if you share it. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you so Thanks much, everyone. sir. Uh, the YouTube link also will hand it over, so you can always refer back to the recording. Right. Oh, that's true. That's true. Right. And and in fact, please do send me the YouTube link as well. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was really informative and fun. Okay, thanks.